So I'm now going to um, hand over to Richard. Um, we're really delighted that he's been able to join us today to talk a little bit about his perspective as an autistic person um, and, and, and things that are important to him when working with him. Um, and hopefully that will give everyone a bit of an insight about how one might approach working with autistic people in general. So Richard, I'm gonna hand over to you. I'm just gonna turn my um, video off um, and um, stop sharing. So um, Richard, are you happy to show your slides? Yeah, I was gonna joke, is that quite a wise thing to do? But um, <laughs> you might. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a short 10 minute slides um, presentation on uh, autism mental health using me as a case study in some cases. Um, I'm a PhD student at London South Bank University and I'm doing a PhD studying pathological demand avoidance which I could talk about in great length but I won't here. <laughs> um, so um, and also uh, my first article was published five years ago today so I'm quite happy with that. Um, I just got a cheap plug out of the way. Um, yeah about what is it people when you're dealing with them um, you probably have heard that we all have spiky profiles, but if you actually dig into literature around kind of like mental health and kind of disorders and that kind of stuff, it's kind of expected that all human beings have um, spiky profiles. It's just with autistic people, it tends to be more pronounced compared to um, other people. Um, if you actually dig into it, most disorders are associated with kind of trauma and or aversive childhood experiences. Um, so when you kind of look into the crew, uh, the co-occurring difficulty um, prevalence rates for autistic people, it's something like 70% of us have at least one and at least 40% of us have at least two. Um, I myself have, I, I have multiple ones that are diagnosed and multiple ones that probably are not diagnosed. Um, yeah, um, and often like the reason why a lot of autistic people have so many co-occurring conditions is or difficulties is often because we're treated quite poorly by society. Um, and you've got to look at the various stats around autistic people um, to kind of to kind of understand that. Um, yeah, um, as I said, you're not just dealing with autism, you're dealing with um, often with quite a few different co-occurring difficulties, both kind of uh, sensory or kind of these can often be physical um, impairments, disabilities and stuff as well. Um, and literature kind of acknowledges that co-occurring difficulties can interact with the children in sometimes in quite unpredictable ways so what this means is that kind of stuff like anxiety depression it can look slightly different in autistic people compared to non-autistic people um, and other like literature notes for example that anxiety has different kind of causal mechanisms in autistic people compared to non-autistic people um, and it can also be difficult to disentangle kind of what features are actual to different kind of constructs or difficulties or categories um, you can probably get a bit about my own kind of philosophy and approach towards kind of mental disorders by my kind of terminology I'm using. Um, so, yeah, um, a lot of autistic people have a substantial amount of trauma, um, and it is a quite a pressing and hot topic within the community. Um, and often kind of trauma-based kind of categories or disorders can often, often overlap autism. It can be quite difficult to kind of differ uh, differentiate between autism and can lead to kind of misdiagnosis or misdiagnosis. So classic one is borderline personality disorder in autistic females. Um, quite a few autistic females will get misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder when they're actually just often traumatized autistic persons. Um, the blow is a screenshot of a tweet I did a few weeks ago asking about can autistic people recover from trauma and what does it look like and it got quite a lot of attention for me on Twitter and um, so I've got it on there not to show off but to indicate it is quite a pressing issue within the autistic community. Um, so I'm going to mention a bit about my own kind of struggles so I have a true to sexually functioning. Um, my communication style can be quite atypical as you might have noticed I can go quite quick. I struggle a lot with avoidance of demands um, particularly with academic work, which is kind of reverse ironic considering I'm doing a PhD. Um, I have intense emotions and I'm kind of stuck, which is kind of the rational aspect of me, and my kind of intense emotions and kind of strong sense of need for control. I can be quite easily triggered, but I try to regulate my kind of my emotions and my cognition and my kind of behaviours, just being quite highly rational. But um, yeah, um, I, I don't have quite a few difficulties. Um, I have to have a, I have a very niche environment where I'm, where I'm highly productive. Um, positive aspects about me, I'm quite easy amused, um, as you can probably tell by the puns at the top of the slides. Um, I have a good attention to detail, I'm quite highly intelligent, I'm highly creative, and quite good self-awareness, as you can probably tell, and I have a strong passion for sense of right or wrong, but as I said previously, that can be an issue if I'm quite easily triggered on something I'm passionate about. Um, so, 
yeah, this is uh, a couple of notes around working with autistic people. So despite what you might read about us, because a lot of the literature views us as having deficits and being less than human, um, I would argue we are all fully human, um, even, if we, even if we have substantial difficulties, and many of us do. Um, we are an exceptionally diverse population, but presently there's no successful way to divide autistic peoples, and I don't think there's ever going to be my own personal view on that one. Um, yeah, you cannot separate the autism out from me. Um, there's a kind of a classic line in one book I read where, where um, someone killed an autistic person to try and kill their autism, and the only way they could kill the autism was by killing the, the person. It's You can't separate them out. Um, it's an intrinsic part of who I am. I'd argue due to... Um, previously mentioned how we kind of generally purely treated by society that we are all kind of complex or perplexing cases um just because society doesn't seem to treat us well at all generally speaking um i tend to advocate for a co-regulating and a transactional approach to working with autistic people including myself um and it's just basic stuff like listening to me and treatment of other people like work with my strengths and interests and you have to genuinely take a person-centered approach for work with autistic people because if not you're not going to count for the spiker profile and we have very very atypical profiles a lot of the time there's some areas where we can be ridiculously good at, and other areas we can be atrociously poor at within the same individual um and yeah but at the same time you do have to count for us being autistic um account for the autism because autistic people often have a very intense lived experience versus non-autistic people um and if we do something, it's usually for a rational or a good reason. Um, and I kind of put on there from whose perspective, because from outsiders' perspective, some of our actions might seem weird or confusing or making no sense whatsoever. Um, the question is, is kind of working out what's going on? Why are we doing it? And it can be problematic for us as autistic people to understand for, because um, we might have issues um, understanding our emotions or understanding our body states, for example. Um, but yeah. Um, also, if we're stressed, it tends to be because of the situation we're in and or due to kind of previous aversive experiences. Um, so, for example, if autistic people uh, are anxious in social situations, it's often because we've been treated poorly in certain social situations. Um, and the general kind of point, so I'm going to conclude on this side, is like general kind of comments about working with autistic people. So, like, always consider, always consider sensory issues. So, um, for example, you might be noticing with me in the talk i tend i've been telling just to listen to what's being said and not pay attention to people's faces and i i often do that because it's easy for me to process one set of sensory information at a time and um, so it's much more important to me to listen to the kind of verbal communication than the visual a lot of the time um yeah so or sometimes you need to consider camouflaging or masking um a lot of the time and also there's a thing with some people saying that like you need to lose a, use a lower arousal approach with autistic people, which I do agree with, but that does not equal no arousal. Autistic people do need to be kind of stimulated and engaged with and, and engaged in stuff that we're interested in. And also there's nothing of like people having this wonderful thing of just imposing routines onto us that often causes us more issues than it actually solves. We do really well when you actually work with us and build routines um, on our terms. Um, this is just a uh, a quick side on like working with me so allow me to self-regulate so I've been using a fidget spinner to try and help me kind of stim what I out of the way um to kind of calm down and deal with my anxiety while doing this talk for example um a long one is I don't seem to be able to see it but I have a long belt which I tend to play around with a lot um and I've already mentioned a bit about me how I might tilt my head to one side to kind of focus on what's being said I didn't quite express it with my hands as you probably noticed when I'm kind of accidentally waving them around um yeah, for me as an autistic person, I don't necessarily always agree with non-autistic social norms. I might not always be aware of them. Um, I don't necessarily care about all of them. Um, so don't expect me to kind of always follow them. And obviously within reason, like expect to follow laws and stuff. Um, engage with subjects I'm interested in. Uh, negotiate with me if possible. Use puns. I like puns. Um, you might have got the joke which uh, I suggested earlier when I started sharing the screen. Sharing the screen. Like, do you think it's do you think it was a good idea to do that? Um, yeah, treat me as being a human being and take my perspective seriously. There's been quite a few times where I've been hurt when people have not actually validated my lived experience when they really should have done, and especially when I've been quite highly distressed. Um, and quite a couple of concluding comments. So. This is just a quote from the 2015 England Autism Strategy. And um, what it points out is that even people who could be diagnosed with kind of high functioning autism or Asperger's, they can often struggle to, uh, to have, uh, they can often have quite a high amount of difficulties in their own personal lives. And the reason why I'm saying this is, is, is because a lot of autistic people 
across the entire kind of spectrum or continuum of autism, whatever language you use, a lot of us all have issues and all struggle to get access to appropriate support. Um, and this is a final question I've been using up my kind of academic quote, but I think it's equally applicable in this context is like, how do you feel about autistic persons creating disorder that pathologizes your non-compliance in creating a friendly well, an autism friendly world and lack of empathy towards us? And this is just to kind of get you to kind of reflect upon how you interact with autistic people and trying to um, be more empathetic. And um, this some stuff, it goes back to some stuff Sean was saying about kind of being aware of your prejudices and kind of biases and not always kind of collaborators in a, in a positive or necessarily helpful way. And it's just going to get you to kind of reflect upon that. Um, and the last couple of slides is like my contact details and references. And um, I kind of realized I, sh I should have changed bibliography to references, but yeah. Um, sorry if that's been a bit lightning quick, um, but yeah. Is that okay for me to stop sharing or? Yes, that's great. Thank you so much, Richard. That's absolutely perfect. And um, and, and and covers you know an awful lot of the sorts of things that just people need to think about a bit. And I'm and, aware that and, can be quite full on, which I think came across. <laughs> that's absolutely perfect. Um, and and going back to as you say to the biases things, that the, the key thing about unconscious bias is is that actually one needs to stop and think, not react. And, and the entire and, thing in the autism niche called the empathy problem, which I'm really hoping the other two speakers cover, which is really relevant. So well, we'll yeah, have time I'm to just shut up and, and no, 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 not at all. No, we, we've got plenty of time for discussion as well. So um, thank you so much, Richard. I'm going to um, now uh, introduce uh, Joe and Marie. Well, I'm going to actually let you introduce yourselves um, and just say a little bit about. Um, about how you've approached the world and, and how you think other people might do well to approach the world. Okay, are you happy to share slides? Or at least yeah. the slides? Let me find them. Oh. <laughs> Bingo, that's it. We're actually, we're, we're doing a double act on this one. I, um, we're going to do this more as I suppose a conversation with some reminders from the PowerPoint slides that we've got here, um, if that's all right with you guys. Um, so we, we kind of put our introductions sort of all squished together because actually um, it's, it's not always easy to sort of, to sort of pick out who, who's, who's the autistic expert by experience and who's not autistic expert by experience. Um, so we'll just let you have a look through these and try and work out who does what. <laughs> and although I'm screen sharing, I now can't see chat. And um, as a bit of fun, if anybody wanted to, we thought you might like to have a punt at uh, guessing in the chat which of which of us you think each of these things apply to, and mm. need a few out for people who prefer to hear rather than read. I have sort of now got our pictures in front. So off the top of my head, between the two of us, um, one of us spins wool, one of us jumps into lakes and rivers, prances around on a stage, plays a ukulele. And those things are probably more important about us than the other things in our lives. One of us had an autistic parent, I'm going to give you a free pass and say, I think both of us have autistic offspring. One of us is married to an autistic person. One of us is autistic. Um, one of us works for Skills for Care. One of us is a strategic commissioner. And at the end of the day, it kind of doesn't matter because I do sometimes go to things and have to think, Am I here as this or am I here as that? But at the end of the day, I'm one person and I, and I take whatever I've got to offer and whatever's happened at home that morning with me, as we all do. Um, I was at an event this week and a chap was talking about how the co-production he's been involved in has felt much more meaningful since it's been online because all those people that he had to travel to meet with and who he saw in their suits looking very professional. Somehow they've had to 
acknowledge that they've got messy rooms at home and dogs that bark and husbands that demand cups of tea when they're in the middle of an important meeting. Mm-hmm. And he felt that that had really, I don't want to say levelled, but it had helped people see each other as whole people in their humanity with things that they bring and difficulties and deficits rather than that model of here are the professional people they're normal and have a proper life and here are the people with a disability or a social care need um yeah I've waffled on enough (laughs) so our brief for this was really to talk about doing co-production from the professional side um, but also bringing in our own lived experience from the non-professional side because I don't think that it's ever really something that you can completely take off and walk away from. Uh, For my sins I'm the one who plays the ukuleles and I spin wool. Um, I'm not quite brave enough to jump into freezing cold lakes. I'm, I'm a 3P in that I am both a, an autistic person, I'm a parent of autistic people, and I'm working as a professional in the field. I work for a clinical commissioning group as an expert by experience, which means that I go and do transforming care, um, care and treatment reviews, to try and get people out of hospital and into the right provision of support in the community. And I also use some of that in my NHS England work. Um, there are many national and regional hats that I wear, um, but I just think that I'll probably stop at that level. Um, and we could perhaps move on to the next slide after. Yes. Marie. That's <laughs> okay. I just have to go and tell someone to shush, completely demonstrating what I was just saying, really. So co-production really sort of came to the fore in the Care Act 2014. Uh, It was one of the first pieces of legislation specifically included in the concepts of co-production and its statutory guidance. Um, The guidance defines co-production and suggests that it should be a key part of implementing the Care Act. And then it's been built into the statutory guidance of the Autism Act, um, especially since the statutory guidance since 2015 onwards, including the the most recent statutory guidance that, that came out last Last year, it is last year. Um, SCIE defines the co-production as people who use services and care as working with professionals in equal partnerships towards shared goals. Um, and hopefully this slide deck will be brought out to you as, as a, a PDF so you can follow the links that I've put into it. But there's a really nice little YouTube video, it's only five minutes long. That, that equates levels of co-production as, as sort of like how you involve it in a football team. Some people who understand football, which I don't, um, this might be a more useful way of envisaging various levels of, of working with um, your service users. Marie, do you have anything you want to say on this? Um, no, I just, I was putting a message in the chat and I realised uh I was saying don't jump in a river or a lake you need to walk in slowly so that you acclimatize and so that you know how you're going to get out and it occurred to me that that might be a message about co-production to take it step by step and accept that sometimes sometimes you just feel a bit too chilly and scared and you have to get out and try again yeah I, 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 absolutely. Um, that's that's very that's very apt. If we go to the next slide, then, um, because I've been involved, um, especially in the um, Midlands Autism Workstream, which is all about trying to implement the latest autism strategy uh, across the Midlands. Um, I've seen varying examples of co-production from some areas that don't do it at all to other areas that seem to be getting it quite right. Um, And one thing that seems to come over most when I I observe these things is that often professionals are really worried about it. They they go, we don't know how to do this. How do do we do this? What's what's the way to do (laughs) co-production? 
um, and, and and this is where I sort of say yes it helps to dip your your toes into the water and 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 feel your way but I would say that the number one rule that you need is that you need to check first of all when you have people in the room that you're working to the same goal establish that that's really really important so with the Midlands Autism Workstream they very quickly realized that they needed to have autistic people embedded in the process initially as a core team as advisors but that what came out of that was that they established an expert by experience group um, of for a forum so that there was was many many more voices feeding into the core experience group um, to steer work stream and and how they went about things it's been extremely useful and I'll talk more about that later after this slide um, because we've produced useful documents that people can use and and we're still sort of growing and developing it. The thing I think that's most important about co-production is that it is like a conversation. It's something that you don't just do for its own sake. You have to know what you're intending to get out of it and how you're going to work with people in it. So if you don't want to have tokenistic appointments, you need to know who you're asking, why you're asking to join you on the journey. And it is about traveling together, not just doing one thing and then stopping and going away. There's another really, really good example that I know of in North Sorry. Eastern. Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Okay, there's another really, really good example in North East Lincolnshire with their adult autism service, and they also have a community interest company that's grown out from the adult autism service where they're using um, autistic, originally autistic people steered the service, they had a partnership, an autism partnership board that wasn't for it unless it was 50% autistic. And they from that they've produced um, uh, autism alert cards and they've been working with police various other things um, the far away kick now provides autistic mentors and peer support so it's growing and it's growing at a, a really rapid pace it's almost like once they got the core team together then they just started opening it out into all the other areas that they needed to to put people and to get things working so it's really worth going and checking out the faraway kick and the North East Lincolnshire Autism Service uh, because they're, they're, they're actually sort of living and breathing it and doing it properly. A lot of autistic people sort of approach professional service providers, um, partnership boards, as a way to make sense of the difficult experiences that they've had in trying to obtain services or have their needs met in the first place. A lot of us are quite traumatized by lack of provision and lack of understanding around our needs, especially if um, we're somebody that on the outside appears to be quite uh, able. I'm sitting here talking to you. Um, you don't see the bits of me that don't work so well. I make um, a very, very strong decision not to show people <laughs> the bits of me that don't work well because um, they've been taken advantage of in the past and that's not good. So, you, you know, it's really important to understand that autistic people come to you with, with, with a need to make things better, not just for themselves, but for other people as well. So you need to make sure that you are working to the same goals and that this isn't just, uh, oh, we're doing this because the Autism Act says we have to. Yeah, okay, so to next slide. Thanks. So I, I mentioned the autism work stream. I mentioned that the core um, Autistic Experts by Experience group was started and then they created a focus group. Um, they gained insights from the focus group to, um, to establish the priorities and how that the, uh, the work stream moved forward. So 
the autistic people were saying this this is what we need to do first and this is and maybe we need to do it in this way um well, very recently we've established a community of practice within um, systems in the midlands looking at specific topics that both the systems are interested in and the experts by experience and the number one thing came up was co-production how to do it what's the best way to get about it we created an interactive document to support this called the informing autism service improvement through lived experience insight <clears throat> it's got a bit of an nhs name <laughs> it's very very wordy um, we, we, we just call it the emerging themes document because, you know, you, you end up losing the will to say the whole thing. <laughs> um, and I have a link to that, I think, somewhere a bit further on in this presentation, hopefully. So maybe the next slide. Yes. Oh. Oh. Yeah, OK, so this is the front page of it and the first part of the contents. Yes, it's very long, but you can go down to the subtitles and then you can just sort of look up specific things that are of interest to you. Um, we have it on um, the NHS share folder, but not everybody can access it. It depends which NHS um, group you're in or whether or not you're even in the NHS. So I've also whacked it up on my Google Drive. I promise you this is not a Trojan that link will get you to the document so you can download it as a PDF. Next slide, please. So <laughs> things, <laughs> things to talk about with co-production. I mean, so ideally, you need to be thinking about equality, diversity, accessibility, and reciprocity. You need to make particular efforts to include different groups. And those might be the people whose voices are harder to hear, or even people who aren't speaking, don't speak in the first place. Um, there is a one third of autistic people have an associated learning disability as well. So you need to think about how you incorporate views and the needs of that group you need to think about how accessible meetings are some people find it's much more accessible to attend meetings online um, yes if you have the it know-how and the technology but there are other people who really really struggle with that one of the really powerful things that the faraway kick in northeast lincolnshire did was when covid happened they got a grant basically to distribute electronic equipment to people who didn't have any and that included also funding for internet connections even if it was sort of wi-fi dongles going to a mobile network or whatever so that people had some way of accessing meetings online they also meant some people going out or finding ways to show people how to use the equipment because that's not always straightforward. I and mean, I think all of us have struggled with Teams or Zoom at some point in our lives. <laughs> the technology is as updated at an awkward time and let us down just at the wrong moment. Um, yeah, we, we've we've all struggled with that. It's it's also really, really, really important to understand that when you're asking people to work with you in a co-production way, not so, so to avoid being tokenistic, you have to think about who is the best person to do the work, to make it work for them as well as work for you. But at the same time, you tend to find that the same people get asked to do things again and again and again. Um, I've had some people say to me that I send a crop up everywhere. And I'm very aware of that and I feel really, really, really bad about it. I'm quite good at doing these sort of meetings and presentations um, and um, I'm quite tech savvy. So at the moment, yeah, I'm kind of cropping up everywhere because I'm somebody who can do this. But I am only one autistic person. I cannot speak for everybody and I would much rather open the door for other people to come through and come forward so that people are listening to far more people than me. I think, I think Joe, what's important with that is thinking about in any project or piece of work where the right, 
the right opportunities are there for the right number of people so as you know it's often said isn't it if you meet one autistic person mm. you meet an autistic person and so what and and most of these are things I think I've struggled with or got wrong in the past and I'm trying to get better at and um, so if if you need to involve some people at the very beginning of a project in deciding how to do it and what the scope is, almost by definition, you just have to ask a small number of people that you already know. Because the other thing that lots of people say to us is don't decide it all and then come and ask us what we think. We need yeah. to be represented right at the start. So I think depending on the project and the scale of the things, you know, one thing that that you, Joe, and uh, other people like you, Dunn, have really taught me is how important it is that if you've only got space to involve one or five people, that mm -hmm. they're not just individual people, but they're people who actually represent an autistic led group, whether that's, you know, local, national, whatever's appropriate for the work that you're doing. and that. Yeah those people have that opportunity to go back to a wider group of people and seek their opinions. And then they make sure somewhere along the line, there is the opportunity for many more people to have some input so that you get in that breadth and you're not missing all the people who can't do video calls or all the people who don't use spoken or written language. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, also just in the same way, as if you as a commissioner are asking somebody for somebody to work with, you don't just go down onto the street and, and just grab any old stranger off the street to do things with. Just having the label autist being autistic is, is means that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's got the capacity or the inclination to do this kind of work with you. So there will be people who have been knocking on the door for a very, very long time saying, we want to do something Let us on the partnership board let our voices be here heard here yeah. almost every time um my local council says we, we need to ask autistic people to be involved in some work i just put a shout out and i get 10 15 20 people come back to me saying yeah i want to be involved so there are people who want to come and work with you i think the fear is sometimes more sort of like how to how to manage expectations and how to how to steer things without it becoming completely out of control and you know what to a certain extent you, you can't um you need to know that the autistic people there are actually needing to steer things a little bit because we know what it's like from the inside to what our needs might be and we might also have insight from other people who um, also, you know, their needs might be slightly different from ours, but, you know, have, have, a, have a, a more umbrella view of, of where we're coming at from this. So thinking about who gets asked to work with you is, 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 is an important thing, but also understanding the privilege and power imbalance that an organisation has working with autistic people. Um, it's it's difficult if you if your basic needs aren't being met it's really really difficult to have the capacity and the energy to do work on top of that you know it's it's like a government saying you know in order to solve homelessness people need to be in work but it's really difficult to be in work if you haven't got a home or a base or, or some, somewhere solid to be in order to do that work. <laughs> um, and, and for autistic people, many of us have quite, e even people who look like me have needs that if they're not met means that we haven't got the energy or the capacity to put into co-production work. So it's, it's ideal that everybody should have time and energy to contribute to a co-produced piece of work. In reality, I find that autistic people may struggle because their needs are not met, but also commissioners can be really, really busy people. And 
you need to make sure that the people doing the work from the professional side also have that built into their work schedule so that they have the time and capacity to make sure that everything is right for the, the, the co-produced work. One, one of the complaints that we seem to get from a lot of autistic people working at all levels is that we need things written down beforehand and we need to have enough time to process it and think about it and respond to it because doing it five minutes before a meeting isn't acceptable and that we need to assimilate, assimilate information over more time. Um, so, so there needs to be thought and planning put into this and it needs to be more than just last minute. So, Which, yeah. I think <laughs> I think we're going to probably move on to some questions and, and answers in a minute, Jo. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this was our last slide, but we just wanted to put that last point there to remember that we can. I, these are these are my confessions of things I've got wrong, and um, very blithely talking about health inequalities, and then you know realizing that I'm in a room with people and and I'm telling them things that might be new to them or might be triggering stuff that they don't mm. really think about that day. Um, so I don't want to go into too much detail about that and do it to us all now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. There's the other just prickly issue that I just need to tack on to the end of this is that many autistic people rely on benefits to live and there needs to be recognition that we're doing work and that needs to be remunerated in some way but it also needs to be remunerated in a way that's not going to tank people's benefits because that's their livelihood it's one thing saying oh we need you to do this piece of work and we'll pay you for the six weeks that this piece of work takes to do but at the end of that this person's still got to exist after that and if you've stopped their benefits because their permitted work doesn't allow the level of work that they're doing with you, um, then that is a major problem for that person. There is a duty of care to make sure that people are not going to suffer. But that doesn't mean that you get people for free. It means you need to send people off to do courses on working with people who are paying people who are on benefits. It's complex and the benefit system is absolutely draconian. And you need to be absolutely aware of that. It's worth spending the 100, 150 quid it takes to do a day long course to work, to, to have that knowledge to hand so that you can actually work with people in a useful and a meaningful way and remunerate them in a way that they are not going to be penalized for. Okay. Okay, I think that is, um, we were sort of just, finishing off with some links here really weren't we and some general mm. messages um, the TLAP and Sky have guidance but all of these things are so important it, there, it's tricky what I would say is you're almost definitely going to get it wrong but that shouldn't be a reason not to do it and not to keep trying mm -hmm. I mean if you're if you're trying and if your intentions are good, we will forgive you a lot. <laughs> a heck of a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Can I make an important point about kind of taking us seriously and actually working with us and actually accommodating us? Um, yeah, sure, Richard. Go ahead, Richard. Turn, turn your, you can you, turn your video on if you want. You're... If you look into the literature around autism autist, around autistic people's kind of suicide, suicidal ideation and suicide attempts and suicide actual race they are notoriously high um like something like 60 percent of us have suicidal ideation i often do at the moment it's relatively low because i'm in a relatively good place over the last two or three weeks um but the suicide attempts um is anything depending on what it's literally looking at from like about eight percent to fifteen percent of your uh, autistic population like adult population and um similar kind of figure for kind of successful suicide attempts 
um, there's a couple of studies that suggest it's about 9% of autistic deaths are, are, are due to suicide. Um, and like when we say actually listen to us and take us seriously and take our needs seriously, I can't underpin it enough. Please bloody do. Um, and because um, it could, yeah, the, the too many of us have died through suicide or it's too much of an issue for some of us. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're talking about kind of showing empathy towards us, like this sort of should be um, put into, I think probably we should both should, one of us should have put into the size, like the actual these statistics, they're the grim and they're grim for a reason. And it's often because of how people treat us. Um, and I mean, bear in mind, like, there's a stereotype about autistic people meant to be more rational than non-autistic people. <laughs> I mean, some people might dispute that, but it's a bit of a case of if the suicide rates are that high and we're meant to be rational, put two and two together. Um, so I'm going to shut up there and um, move on because it's it's not a good, it's not, it's not, it's not a good, it's not a pleasant topic to talk about. It's a, it's uh, thank you very much, Richard. I mean, it's a really important thing for people to remember. I think that's the point about it is that, that you know, when people talk um, about trauma and about things that trigger, um, actually there are consequences for, for people and, and those need to be, they're, they're, they're important things to remember. And so I, I'm, I'm very pleased that you brought it up. Thank you. Um, and thank uh, you, Joe and Mari for uh, just, I mean, that was a great sort of overview of you know, what co-production is uh, at its best and uh, at the times when we, as you said, uh, Marie, that, you know, inevitably get it wrong. You know, um, I certainly have um, and I've learned and and one has to apologise and say, you know, let's let's sort of go back a bit and see if we can restart this process. Um, we've, we've got some uh, questions that have turned up in the in, in, in the chat. And and so I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just ask them and to um, just start the conversation in a sense. There were a couple of things that are simply about terms that are uh, perhaps more uh, co easily, uh, co commonly understood by the people who are talking. So things like, uh, you know, what, what does what does it mean to have, uh, uh, have spiky profiles? Do you mean to uh, joke in case? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I think everybody can envision something that they're not good at. Some people are good at maths, other people aren't. Some people are good at dancing, other people aren't. Some people are good at singing, other people aren't. So when we say that everybody, and, and they, we can all think of some things maybe that we're quite good at. So some people can touch type, other people can sing, dance, all those other things. We don't expect everybody to be the same. The difference when we're looking at autistic people and what we're capable of doing is that some things we're really maybe really really good at and some things we may be really really not very good at at all um, my executive functioning isn't brilliant i find the things that most people find easy phenomenally difficult to do and that was the reason i sought my daughters and diagnosis in the first place was i needed to try and explain to my family why things that they just thought i should be able to do because i'm a woman uh, I really, really, really couldn't uh, because they kind of expect women to be housewives and things. Um, <laughs> yes. sorry, why I'm not very good I at that either, man. actually. <laughs> I married a man. I didn't marry a building. Um, anyway, um, so, so I find that there are some things that I can do really, really well. I mean, I have a master's with a distinction from the University of Birmingham. Um, so I'm quite academic, um, but if it comes to um, something sort of physical like dancing, I'm really quite dyspraxic. <laughs> so, uh, so what How I'm taking you? away from it is that, 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 that sort of everybody's got spiky profiles, but perhaps autistic people the have like bigger spikes and bigger def yeah. not deficits, but bigger things that they're not so good at. Is that that right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Richard. I so, Mary, do you want to go first? Yeah, I wanted to, so outing myself as not autistic, but living with two autistic people, I think in relation to sort of health and social care, the particular thing about the spiky profile that causes problems is people tend to equate being able to talk mm -hmm. with being able to do other things or being clever. So um, 
you know, if, if you want some social services support, the assessment actually involves people asking you what you can do and you telling them. So my son can describe in complete detail exactly how to do his laundry and make a meal. He can't actually do it in practice, but the social services system says he doesn't need any support because he can. He says he can do it. <laughs> my husband, like, like Joe and Richard, he has a degree. He can speak very eloquently and fluently, but in any sort of medical situation, even just a, an appointment about an ear infection, he'll come out and he has no clue what the person said to him because he can't, the stress means he can't retain it. But that person would think, well, I had a conversation with a perfectly, with a person who definitely understood everything I said to them. He's, he hasn't retained any of it. Yeah. There's, what I was going to point out, a good example would be um, the non-speaking population of autistic people is transient over time, over lifespan and different situations. So some of us can be stressed into being non-speaking or what some people would call non-verbal. Um, for me, for example, I am incredibly creative kind of academically. Um, I'm very good at information matching. I'm a lateral thinker. That's my default cognitive style. So I'm very good at information matching and putting things together and um, making like novel insights and stuff. Um, getting me to kind of write an academic task and complete it on time um that is it's been a notorious issue for me over my academic career uh, even and from my undergrad to postgrad and even part of my phd um and but it can be a bit more than that it's like i struggle to do too many things at once so if i've got too many activities or too many tasks on my agenda i won't do any of them well so i have to kind of give you very narrow very focused um but it's even like now like when i was mentioning my talk like i will tend to if i'm communicating focus on one kind of century input at a time normally verbal um more necessary over kind of uh visual although i can do both depending on the situation and context but there's times where um i have to be focusing focus exclusively like taking notes for example during lectures and seminars but if it's something i that's my special interest um i can do both i can listen and do notes and kind of type almost it's multitask and this is one of the aspects of spiker profile if you're doing stuff that we're passionate about our special interests um our functioning ability tends to go straight for the roof mm. um as soon as you get away from that it tends to fall off a cliff <laughs> and uh, um and i'm um i'm not trying to exaggerate it it, mm. it can be very stark like that um and some reason I'm trying to say that the spike records they, they do change and they're very much do fluctuating. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's yeah. Um, I think that 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 gives me a sort of really clear picture that firstly to not make assumptions about what somebody might be able to do well or not well based on one bit of information. So they're sort of I can hold this conversation and therefore if I was in that conversation, I would be able to do X, Y, Z, but not make those assumptions about someone else, even if it is sort of, it might might seem like that would be the obvious thing to jump to. So it goes, it's, it's sort of, it's not quite unconscious bias, but it's that sort of automatic assumption about what is possible and what is not possible for an individual without checking that stuff out with them. There's a good reason why I say engage with us on uh, um, things we're passionate about or interested in. Um, not only because it's like good for any human being's quality of life, but you generally seem like to get more things out of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> just more generally, it's, it's often the only way to sometimes educate certain autistic children or even adults. Um, mm. So, yeah, it, it's... it's um, I, I, it's a bit awkward it, it's kind of like if you're trying to map kind of people's kind of characteristics you would naturally have spiky profiles such like mm. it's it's impossible for a human being to be completely normal or their mm. statistics to completely be um average under going to gals and curves or the bell shaped curves um I'm trying to put in terminology which people shouldn't understand mm -hmm. um and and the reason why I mentioned it at the start of my talk, because the DSM-5 acknowledges that. It's the reason why they have residual categories, diagnoses, like for autism, if you don't meet threshold, you need to get social, uh, social communication disorder, um, pragmatic in brackets, off the top of my head. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so a, there's a couple of things in the chat here where people are sort of saying, you know, and I'm just, I just want to check out whether this makes sense to you, that actually, you know, that one of the things that perhaps one more ought to, ought to more routinely do is to check out what somebody has or hasn't understood um, in, a, in a particular situation, whether that's a GP consultation, which is that sort of talk 
back approach, which is say, you tell me what you think I've told you sort of thing. Um, um, but actually that might apply to co-production situations as well to actually check out what what people or groups of people have have understood has happened or is going on does is that is that a useful approach do you think uh, do, you, do you joe or mary want to answer this because i can do i just don't want to just hog the q a <laughs> that's what i'm mindful of so um so it depends uh, obviously how you're working sometimes i would say that all of these things actually work quite well for neurotypical people as well <clears throat> I find I, I um, spend quite a lot of time um, giving social stories to non-autistic people about um, non-autistic people. Um, there is there is a thing called the Accessible Information Standards 2016. Um, so like for Marie's example of um, your husband who, who might not be able to retain information that's been imparted by a doctor in a medical setting um, um, it, it is in the law that we have to find out what the preferred communication for um, pe people with learning disabilities and autistic people, in fact, really everybody, um, is, and that that information needs to be recorded and disseminated so that if somebody, say, needs easy read, everybody knows that person needs easy read communication. Um, that's also, I would say, part of the course of how people should be using, working with people in any kind of uh, statutory setting like partnership boards this is information that's unique to that individual if one person needs easy read and somebody else doesn't need easy read and for some autistic people easy reads actually more confusing than plain text um, you need to know how to communicate with people and work with them at that level and it's and it's meeting people at that level richard you have your hand up yeah um i was going to mention about social stories they actually are quite widely used outside of autism um they can be they can be used for people with attachment disorder like children young persons with attachment disorder and or kind of looked after children and stuff so um social communication difficulties are quite common outside of autism outside of autism as well um so um I'm trying to Richard, point out would that, you like, like to just say a little bit more about social stories for those people on the call that might uh, yes, uh, on the so webinar who might not understand created by I think Sue Grace of the name is with an A uh, um, back in the 1990s I think and uh, so what it is is that you provide like a comic strip and you would kind of um, teach um, a child or a person to be able to interpret the kind of dynamics of social interaction that's happening in this kind of strip um, and it's to try and get them to people to develop the theory of mind although I think for mind's a crap autism theory but that's a tangent um, but yeah that's off my head um, so yeah um, I forgot what I was going to say because there's a comment I was going to pick up on. So we were talking about um, communicating with people, kind of going back and forth. Yes. Yeah. So um, it can be good practice, but it's also a reasonable adjustment for people to ask to points of clarification if needed. So it's sometimes if you're doing that, you're kind of preempting them from doing that. Um, so it can help. Sometimes it can might actually confuse your autistic person if they gave in too much information, and if you because they could be they could still be processing the information previously, and they might get back to you if you're given processing time. So this goes back to what Joey's saying about working with the individual. Um, but can I go about the double empathy problem now, or should I lit shut up? Um, you're very happy for you to expand on that. Yes, do do go on. So double empathy problem is a theory that was put, proposed in the autism literature by Damien Milton, who's an autistic academic based at University of Kent and also one of my PhD supervisors, um, site tangent. But um, yeah, so what it points down is so instead of um, the traditional medical model based literature of autism, so that say that autistic person's social communication issues are due to empathy deficits and theory of mind deficits. What the empathy problem suggests is, is that it's actually a transactional approach um, focusing on the interactions between two people. And it's any kind of human being. So it's not just autistic people and non-autistic people. It can be autistic and, and autistic people and non-autistic and non-autistic. What it suggests is, is that the kind of, um, when, when autistic people experience social interaction issues with other people, it's due to a breakdown in kind of um, saliences or kind of um, lived experiences and perception of what's going on. Um, in that social interaction um, and there's actually a growing body of empirical literature on this um, to the point when actually now there's going to be a, a stream or a seminar on um, 
on Dublin for Problem Insight, which is the main autism, international in, uh, autism conference like globally. Um, and there's really wonderful research, research coming out called talking about how people's biases, um, some subconscious biases impact how they treat autistic people and, and how autistic people tend to interact differently compared to non-autistic people. But when we're interacting with other autistic people, our communication abilities are comparable to non-autistic people interacting with non-autistic people um and this is a growing body of research and actually quite good quality research overall from understanding don't quote me on that because i don't know if this one's done a systematic review of it but there is um yeah there's this there's, there's quite a lot going about it there's a lot of hype mm -hmm. within the autistic community in the uk on the WNC problem because it kind of completely reverts its high emphasis that we're broken and mm. and all it kind of all this kind of justification of treat us horribly just because it views stuff being transactional and, and kind of um focusing kind of break down kind of communication uh, interaction with people. And it's just like a lot of the kind of stuff we're going on here is trying to make sure that we're and it's cool um between us, us five four speakers is to make sure that we're understanding and, and communicating with each other well so it's like i'm clarifying going you can be talking now do you want to do this or whatever just to make sure that we're on similar wavelets and actually we're not misunderstanding stuff mm -hmm. and this is kind of a good way of kind of maintaining kind of saliences and perceptions of what's going on even if we're not all sharing the same interpretation the, the overall general interpretation that we're all sharing is really the same from the four speakers that's how i would interpret this situation um mm -hmm. and the WMF problem yeah do you, do you joe or mary want to add any um comments i just um, carry on joe <laughs> so um i've just been i've just attended a workshop um where the, there was myself and another autistic person um and a whole load of people who who weren't but worked sort of I suppose with autistic individuals and they'd never actually seen two autistic people just just interacting and getting on uh, from the outside we looked perfectly normal <laughs> um, and this was commented upon uh, at quite length as, um, in including one psychologist from Turkey who says I really need to interview you because this is amazing what I'm seeing here and saying Oh, you know, if, 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 if you know, a, an autistic person on their own is perfectly happy and perfectly functional because um, expectations and society's norms are not being imposed upon them. It's only when you put us in an environment where people are expecting you to be radically different from the way that you're made up that it's, it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. There is research that shows that autistic people are much more tolerant um, in the, the mismatches of conversational style or conversational topics than non-autistic people are um, because we're kind of used to suppose sort of throwing a wider net to get interests areas of in, co-interest or areas where you're both interested in to, to talk about um, so it's it's an interesting area uh, of research and it's um, definitely I think opened up the door um, I have always said to people that if you're talking about us without involving us, basically, it's gossip. It might be academic gossip. It might be medical gossip. But if you aren't actually including us in that conversation where we're not able to actually sort of say, actually, hang on, you're doing exactly what you're accusing us of, um, then it's, it's gossip. And it's not nice gossip. It's harmful. We've got an awful lot of redressing to do. We've had 40 years plus, actually more like 60 years, where people, where autistic people have been pathologized and seen as not functioning human beings. We are all members of the human spectrum and we all have an equal place on it. Um, now it's time for those of us who can to sort of stand up and say, actually, examine those prejudices examine those ways of thinking because from our point of view you know <laughs> we're not the ones that are behaving badly and, and I, th I think that's 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 a really powerful idea isn't it that that, that actually if, if you if you put constantly pathologize somebody else actually it changes the way in which you then relate which isn't necessarily in their interests or indeed in yours or society. So there's something very clear, I think, in that message about saying actually, you know, you don't. The pathologizing is not helpful, um, and that this is uh, about uh, making sure that people can genuinely see how how they how they might need to change behaviour, 
but they don't need to change behavior in such a way that it becomes something that is then uh, discriminating, distancing, pathologizing. I've I'm got just gonna, sorry, sorry, Richard. I've got a couple of quick points. Um, I was going to say, for a population demographic, which is meant to be not fully human, we seem to be pretty good at producing um, autistic people um, from a reproduction perspective. But also adding back to kind of Joe's point about us being kind of more tolerant about kind of um, different kind of communication styles, interactions. There's some research suggesting that autistic children, young persons tend to realise they're different from a lot younger age than mm -hmm. um, many people would kind of assume. Um, so it's possible from our lived experience perspective, we're Think that we're different with other people we might be naturally have differences naturally might flow from that so yeah that's the only couple of points i was going to make so if you want to carry on sean no no that makes up that makes that makes sense thank you um i was just going to pick up one of the other questions that was put into the um q a um which was actually to um uh, ask people to expand a bit on that idea of co-regulating does anyone want to take it do you want me to I think you raised that, um, okay. Richard. So, yeah, um, I need to put a coy here because I do uh, do some work for Studio 3 who do the low arousal approach, which I do advocate for people using. Um, and by coy, I mean conflict of interest. So the entire point about co-regulating is, and it's even based with the spell framework, which is oh, quirky structure, positive expectations, empathy, low arousal, and links as in kind of cooperating with different kind of stakeholders group, but it's NAS users. Um, it's basically realizing, it's kind of links to the problem in some aspects, that your autistic people just don't, aren't just blanks so we just don't come with kind of we don't just spew stuff out by ourselves um that's unwarranted or unproduced uh, autistic people will naturally interact with their environment because we are human beings and we are um so what it means is that um and it goes back to the point of saying if we're stressed it's often due to the environment that we're in so um for example high, some people can be highly anxious due to kind of the clothing work can be like really itchy or kind of uh, uncomfortable for other reasons and there's some some of those people are going to have some really weird and wonderful sensory perspective so we've heard a story of someone who feels like if they if they're anything touching their knee kneecaps it feels like their knees on fire <laughs> so um and what i'm pointing this out is is that other people around us in the environment um they are how they're acting how they're presenting can impact autistic people um so there's concepts like emotional contagion so the emotions that you're expressing can be felt upon um and kind of be transferred onto other people and stuff so despite what some people might tell you a lot of autistic people are highly empathetic and can be kind of quite easy to stress by how much empathy they have mm -hmm. um so yeah there's other kind of um so what this kind of goes back to is kind of going goes back to the uh, transactional stress model and the transactional stress model is actually underpinned in DSM-5 criteria and the reason why I say that is criteria C which is the one that says that we're going to be from early infancy however one of the caveats for this is autism features may not present until the, the, the demands of social interactions outweigh our limited um, coping mechanisms which is by definite which is in line with the transactional stress-based approach um, so what it is about is actually understanding that us as individuals, when we're interacting with other people, how we're interacting with them can mm -hmm. can kind of trigger or cause other people to present mm -hmm. a certain way and present certain stress behaviours. And for a lot of autistic people, that'd be kind of self-interest. Well, not this self-interest behaviour, it could be stimming and other bits and pieces. And carry on, Joe. <laughs> so it's, it's the stress bucket, the point where people overflow. I mean, an awful lot of reality TV is based on that, doing it to neurotypical <laughs> people. If you think about the everyday stresses that autistic people have just to exist in the same space as everybody else, where the environment is not set up for our sensory regulation, um, where the anxiety about social interaction could be going absolutely through the roof. We're at overflow level at what appears to everybody else like a much lower level. It really isn't. I'd say that autistic people probably have far more tolerance of stress because we're under it all of the time just in a normal environment where you may have lights that flicker or you have electricity sounds coming from the walls and, and lots of background sounds so you can't actually hear what the person in front of you is saying. Yeah. <laughs> it goes back to a point about like low arousal is, is it does not mean no arousal like we need to have it's basically making sure that our environment central environment is not overpowering us and mm. kind of automatically triggering us and stuff and it goes back to the point of saying about our lived experience tends to be more intense than non-autistic people mm. um so for me it's like i often have experience uh one century environment more clearly than the other moment so there's something that's really overpowering for me which i can i can um 
so for me, like one of my sentry issues can be um, touch. So they, um, someone actually found a pause button for me. If they pressed it, I would literally stop. Um, and it's a bit of extreme and it was a very neat environment which that happened did, but it, it's possible. Um, and it's kind of like being mindful about what you're doing to us might cause certain issues and stuff. So for example, my own mother's sentry issues is loud unexpected sounds that can cause you a lot of pain um, if you like use a hyperacusis and stuff and it's kind of like making so so for example like if I'm working in schools so and I was doing like TA work and stuff I don't stick me in a bloody primary classroom when I'm doing music lesson for Christ's sake um, it's not like I don't it's not like I don't enjoy being in that situation it doesn't make it's like I do genuinely enjoy working with like kind of in primary classes stuff but obviously the percussion and kind of bass instruments and stuff and in children who are uncoordinated they'll go oh that's just like sent you overloads mm. um it's don't stick me in that situation it's, it's kind of like um yeah it's kind of like working with and doing stuff on their interests so if you're doing so like Damien Milton for example the person who proposed it he'll often talk about table tennis his, his passion if you get him to like bounce ball on the back he can do that for ages or involved in table tennis he'll be completely in the zone or um yeah so it's like if you talk to me about one of my special interests, which is like my my PhD topic, I could talk about that for hours and to be perfectly fine. And although I wouldn't say this the world's burning, but I could probably still be fine and in the zone talking about that and then kind of zoned out. Um, but it's kind of it's, it goes back to kind of hoping acting can convey it well. It's like you kind of we are what you kind of put into us essentially. If you're kind of working on our level, treat us as a person, taking account of like a profile will go far i mean there's a kind of i mean you might have heard of jamie in the line who's quite well known person kind of works for NASA and stuff he has quite high support needs but he does really good programming and stuff i mean and like some of his coding's got into space and stuff and he has um and, and that kind of sign of it and it kind of like we can have very atypical profiles i don't like using that kind of follow language language like atypical and stuff but like our profiles can be really weird and wonderful when you kind of get to know them um so <laughs> Yeah. And I, can I just uh, I, I ask something that sort of relates to this this whole bit of conversation is and goes back to that idea that you know things won't work smoothly all the time, inevitably um, for all of us. Um, and bearing that in mind, and bearing in mind the sorts of things that Joe and, and Richard have been saying about you know the sorts of things that might um, you know mean that the bucket overflows and and then and actually it's too much or that the, or the battery is empty. I think it was the other analogy that was used earlier. Actually, when that happens, what what should what should I do? It'd be lower hours approach. So um, try and remove as many demands as possible. Put us in a position in which you're basically non-threatening so that could often be like only one person that's close by mm -hmm. trying to use very minimal kind of language or kind of contact like maybe have a glass of water a cup of water to one side to allow us to kind of come to and kind of like reorientate ourselves and stuff maybe have mm -hmm. a biscuit ready as well to kind of like because it's nice to kind of, for most people it's nice to have a biscuit i'm not saying like use it as a reward but kind of like just kind of like settle down and kind of get ourselves back together because if you've had a meltdown and we're really stressed it's, it's a form of a panic attack that's really fucking exhausting and i'm having to mind my language there because if anyone who's been really stressed and had a meltdown they're, they're, they're really exhausting experiences mm -hmm. um and it could take time for us to kind of pull ourselves back together pull up mm -hmm. perception uh and reorient ourselves in our sensory environment mm -hmm. um and we can also lose a lot of our kind of spoons after a meltdown which i don't mm -hmm. think a lot of people actually appreciate um and do people know what i'm and say what i mean by spoons i shouldn't have thought so richard please please say do you want to say joe yeah. in theory is basically think of a spoon as an element of energy or capacity or whatever you have a limited number of spoons in a day if something really bad happens or, or you have something that uses up a lot of your spoons you can run out of energy before the end of the day and basically think of autism as an energy limiting condition. Mm -hmm. You know, I can do something like this. I can put a lot of energy, a lot of my spoons into doing this, but I'll probably need to go and lie down for the rest of the day or just do something really sort of peaceful like mm -hmm. playing Minecraft. Um, <laughs> you know, because I'll have run out of spoons mm -hmm. or the capacity to do anything else work related. Okay. Um, so uh, within the disabled communities, people tend to talk about spoons. Oh, I haven't got enough spoons to do this now. Um, I, I might have enough spoons tomorrow. Um, yeah. Sean and Lucy might have realised that my out of office email is set on all the time and it literally says, yes. <clears throat> if I don't respond to your emails all the time, because I don't have enough spoons. Yes. Um, and don't assume that I've read all your emails because I won't have spoons or time to, to do it. Yes. Um, and yeah, so it's it's basically like, 
yeah, if, if, if we had a, a meltdown, um, which is it can be for this form of panic attack, like allow us to basically to recover on our term. Like some people just have like a meltdown back. So it's kind of like kind of things that we kind of use to engage with kind of calm us and kind of reorientate mm-hmm. ourselves. Um because we're kind of interested in stuff and it's different kind of stuff you can use. But it's the idea is is to try and prevent us from getting that situation to begin with. It's the reason why I say kind of co-regulation is to work out where we are as individuals and work with us as people and kind of learn our kind of stress signatures. So like what kind of behaviors or kind of features do we express? But not as our kind of stress levels or anxiety levels kind of rise and um so should we kind of ask awesome. people that at the beginning you know if we're going to do a piece of co-production with a, a group of people yeah. who have autism would should we say should we say look just tell me a bit about the things that actually might be problematic for you as an individual is that is that an acceptable thing to do to start with it's not always possible to sort of know in advance that this is a piece of information that you need to give but it is always useful to ask if somebody can tolerate touch if and how people express distress that that kind of profile that you kind of need to know with people that you're working with you might find that some people, some autistic people, like anybody really has when they're stressed, have got certain yep. tells and mm. that, you know, that you've got to take your foot off the gas mm. and give them some time to process it. But the more stressed we are, the less able often we are to tell you. Sure. <laughs> you no, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. This is too much. And yeah. I, I have problems with people just sort of touching me without letting me know that they're going to touch me first that's that's like an electric shock straight through my system Mm -hmm. and I worked for a while with somebody in the office who who was a hugger or just come along and sort of stand behind you and put their hand on your shoulder and I'm (laughs) please don't do that (laughs) yeah Yeah. Yeah. and Marie I think you you had your hand up there um yeah so I was just thinking from the point of view so everybody's different and everybody will need different things and might not need this week what they needed last week but but I think one of the things you can build into any sort of work project if you're going to do it in co-production is time Mm -hmm. any kind of because whatever each person needs a lot of that might it time might be the thing that unlocks it Mm -hmm. so Joe mentioned some people might want to have papers or bullet points or a heads up about what's going to be discussed and whether a decision might be made. Some people might need to know that there's going to be a chance for a a conversation or a meeting, then there's going to be some time, and then we will have another discussion to make a decision. Now, some people won't, and that will drive them up the wall, but if you've built that time into your project, and if you're the professional person managing the project, if you can really fight and protect that against all the other pressures, mm-hmm. it, it will enable you to, to be in a better position to do what people want. And the other thing I was going to say about asking what would help people is some of that stuff, just everybody involved in the project yeah. would share with each other. Yeah. Because yeah. there may well be people involved. Somebody's put in the message here about if you you know, if menopause is affecting you, whether you're autistic or not, you might want to share with people, I need more time to think about things, or I need a bullet point list after we've had a conversation, or as I often do, I've been on a call for 20 minutes now, I need a loo break, and in the hours, several other people will go, yeah, me too, but I didn't want to say so. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm just looking at the time. We've got a couple more minutes. So I'm going to say, Richard and then Joe, do you have a, a, um, a, a sort of something that you want to say um, about that? Yeah, about very that? quickly yep. about communication styles and preferences. Yep. Um, ask autistic people their preferred communication style. And what, so a good part of co-production or engagement with people is offering multiple ways of communication. Mm-hmm. Um, a barrier for a lot of autistic people is phones, phone calls. A lot of autistic people cannot deal with phone calls. It's, a, lot, it's, a, it's a well-known barrier for autistic people accessing GP services, for example. Okay. Um, so that is going to be my last point. So I'll let Joe kind of finish it off. Okay. Thank following you, Richard. Really, thank you, Richard. So following from, from what Marie said, there is you need to front load it with people who can facilitate and administer 
because that's and, and that costs. Yeah. Um, but you really, really need that level, that attention to detail instead of just sort of chucking everything in a pot and just hoping that it's going to organically happen. It doesn't. That's why we have this problem in the first place. Mm. So you need you need to invest people to, in order to invest in people. <laughs> that makes sense. Thank you very much. That's a really good last minute sort of that's what we want people to take away um so i mean thank you all very very much i mean that was just that was it was great to listen to and and really really informative um and i'm um, i i there are just so many things that uh, have come up that i think actually i can i can rem i can do something with that and and everything from sort of you know making sure that we remember that this is not about autistic people it's about people who are also human that are part you know like like i am like everybody is that actually you know checking out with people what they prefer what works for them what doesn't work for them uh, what to do if something goes wrong these are sort of basic bits of human communication which we should all be able to do um it might require more time it might require more planning it might require a multitude of communication methods but actually these are not things that are impossible to do um, it's not it's not actually asking a lot to say, hang on a sec, we need to just think about how we do this together. Um, and so I'm enormously grateful for um, for um, your time this morning and for sharing as much as you have done. Um, and uh, the just to say that. Um, uh, we've got an evaluation form that we're going uh, Lucy's going to put in the chat. It's really, really helpful for us because we continue to run these webinars to have feedback so it'll take two seconds well two seconds it won't take two seconds it'll take a very short length of your time to fill it in now it's just gone in the chat now so if you could do that that would help us um, and I'm just going to share my screen because um, the thing that I took away which I really liked as a sort of picture was the, the co-production in the lake and so this is probably not the best way to approach co-production so look or, where you're or going. Or indeed open water swimming. <laughs> or indeed open water swimming. So look what you're doing. And so perhaps it's a little bit more tentative, but to be done with a, de a degree of joy and enjoyment for, for us all, because actually this is something that is fun to do. It shouldn't be seen as a chore. It should be seen as actually this is the best way of doing the best things for all of us, because actually at the end of it, you get better services you get better research and you get better education. And uh, that's the bit that I completely believe that actually if you involve people in a way that makes sense for everybody, that's what the that's what you will get at the end of it. Um, and a sense of value and a sense of community, which are all things that are worth having in our lives. So thank you all very much. Um, and uh, we hope to see you at our next uh, webinar, which if you're you've come here today, then we will you'll be on our list and we'll send you uh, information anyway. So bye. Richard, Marie, Joe, thank you so bye. much. Bye. Thank you for coming. Bye. bye.